Robert Young, um, whom I'm introducing today, will be joining MIT as an assistant professor in uh, the Brains and Cognitive Science Department and with a joint appointment in the Schwarzman College of Computing uh, ne starting next week, I think July 1st or the week after. Um, he received his bachelor degree in, uh, from Peking University and his PhD in neuroscience from New York University working with um, Xiao Jing Wang. And during his PhD he studied how distinct types of inhibitory neurons in the brain can coordinate information flow across brain areas. Very nice work. And in another piece of work, he studied how the same artificial neural network can accomplish many cognitive tasks. He still is, I think, a postdoctoral research scientist in the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience at Columbia University, right? Yep. For a few more days. <laughs> and, and, uh, um, I'm very happy to welcome him at CBMM. He's probably the newest member of CBMM. I really think that his approach is exactly what we need to bridge computation with machine learning and to really transform um, deep learning models into serious models of the brain. Right now, they are engineering artifacts with uh, little um, relations, concrete relations with neurons, synapses, and often even with the anatomy and the physiology of the brain. But uh, Robert's approach is, uh, uh, incorporates a lot of biological constraints that we know from neuroscience and his models are real neuroscience models. And we'll speak about some of this work. He has been doing a lot of different things, but some of this work in terms of recurrent networks. So welcome, Rob. Thank you for the invitation and for the very nice introduction. Very happy to be here. So today, um, this is kind of an unusual talk because uh, I'll talk about science, but I'll also give you some opinion on uh, what I think should be the next generation recurrent neural network models for cognitive neuroscience. This is um, by no means, you know, kind of the only view, right? But I want to present you one view um, with, with some evidence from our own work. Uh, so of course, I don't have to tell this audience that neural networks have been used in cognitive science and neuroscience for many decades, right? Dating back at least to the 80s, probably earlier. Uh, in neuroscience, for example, they have been uh, neurons and feed for network have been compared to neurons in parietal cortex, Zipser Anderson, um, and then in the cognitive science field, right, it's a whole business. The connectionists um, have um, did a lot of work, um, right, starting with uh, a lot of these uh, earlier feed for network, but also they did these, for example, like recurrent networks and then multi area recurrent networks. It's a very rich literature. Uh, but in neuroscience, particularly, um, there has been an increased uh, interest since the 2010s. And a lot of it started here at, uh, started at MIT uh, with um, Dan Yemen's work and Jim DiCarlo's work, but many people have also uh, worked on this or too many to be listed here. Uh, at this point, it seems like everyone who's doing computational neuroscience has at least one person in their group who does some neural network, uh, neural network stuff. Now, of course, uh, it's not a coincidence that this happened in the last decade, right? So we have better hardware, deep learning happened, uh, we have better algorithm and better software. Uh, but I wanna make a case that uh, our use of these neural networks in, in cognitive science and neuroscience is not just because it's hot, right? It's just, it's not because it's the latest uh, fancy tool. Uh, there are some fundamental reasons to use them and um, uh, because they have some advantages, but also disadvantages compared to traditional computational models. Um, so we uh, described some of that in, uh, in a recent primer, but there are many, many uh, other interesting reviews and opinion articles on this topic in the last uh, two, three years. So neural networks can of course be used as data analysis tools, but I'm not gonna talk about that. 
So when we use them as uh, kind of computational models of the brain, right, they can help us because um, they allow us to model much more complex behavior. Right? So this is uh, most obvious in vision or other sensory areas. Uh, for cognition, they're really helpful at explaining complex uh, activity that is observed in the brain. It's, it's, very, it's quite hard to capture complex neuroactivity patterns that you observe in prefrontal cortex with hand-designed hand uh, neural networks. Another thing that is uh, very nice about these neural networks is that they provide an optimization or you can call it deep learning perspective or uh, evolutionary perspective. Uh, it provides a way to look at the network, not uh, from kind of um, the objective and the architecture uh, and the learning algorithm instead of necessarily the mechanistic, uh, the mechanistic model after training. And so, but I promise to, so that's kind of why uh, we want to, some of us want to use neural networks in the brain, right? It's not, not because it's, uh, not just because it's convenient and hot. Um, and today I will focus on recurrent neural networks for cognitive neuroscience. And again, this has a long tradition, but uh, really there is a paradigm that has emerged. And, um, and it can be, it's really well exemplified in this paper by, um, by Ramante, David Cicillo, Krishna Shinoy, and Bill Nielsen. And many other people have worked on this tradition um, as well. So the tradition is, is you start with a single task and then you train a single network and you train it on back propagation. And that gives you uh, a computational model, right? So in this paper, uh, they took a, a cognitive task where animals have to make a decision uh, based on the, uh, based on the rule, sometimes they need to tell whether dots are moving left, right. Sometimes they have to tell whether dots are green or, or red. And then they train uh, a vanilla recurrent neural network. Uh, so these are actually very similar to uh, rate-based recurrent networks that traditional computational, computational neuroscientists study. Right? Uh, so in terms of the neurons, uh, they're not that different. The main difference is that these uh, networks are trained with, with gradient-based methods, which is of course uh, not biological, um, not biologically plausible at the face value. Uh, but usually, the uh, the point of this approach is not to mimic uh, learning per se; it's to come up with a candidate model for whatever cognitive task that you're interested in. And then uh, you have this candidate model, and then you can do whatever data analysis you want to do. You can look at neural representation or neurodynamics and so on. For example, here they did some PCA-like um, dimensionality reduction uh, analysis, and then you can compare that with monkeys performing very similar tasks. And, uh, and then you can or make a decision, right? Whether or not this is a good enough match. Um, so, so this is a, um, a nice paradigm because it can be applied to many, many different tasks. Uh, so back in 2016, uh, Francis Son and Xiao Jing Wan and I thought we would apply this paradigm to many classical tasks just to kind of, um, just to make sure that these networks are not doing something crazy. And so you can, for example, take a perceptual decision-making task and take um, kind of neural data, some, some salient feature from the neural data, and then compare the model with it and do this on another task, a parametric working memory task, multi-sensory integration task. So the general lesson here is that uh, usually the most salient feature that people have found in neuroactivity in these um, in prefrontal cortex, for example, can be uh, to some extent uh, recovered in these recurrent neural networks, despite having uh, really different uh, really different learning rules. And all of this is done with supervised learning, but you can uh, play the same game with reinforcement learning, which is uh, more biologically relevant. And then you can find a very similar uh, match between data and model. 
Okay, so this is nice and this is fun. Uh, but of course, today I promise you uh, to talk about the next generation, right? So uh, how to move beyond that. Now, before we talk about how to move beyond that, we should think about why we should move beyond that. Um, so using neural networks to study the brain has um, many problems in itself uh, that everyone already knows about. For example, like it's difficult to interpret, right? The gradient descent is not biological, things like that. Uh, but other than that, there are also some specific issues. Uh, besides that, there are some specific issues uh, when using uh, RNN models for cognitive neuroscience. So one is co uh, cognition involves a wide range of brain areas, right? Cortical and subcortical areas. It's not just a single recurrent network. Uh, cognition is very flexible, right? That's the hallmark of cognition. But when you train a recurrent network on a single cognitive task, it, it is not very flexible. And that's the only task it can, it can do. Uh, and learning of lab task uh, relies on existing circuitry, right? So animals and humans go into the lab and their brain already uh, can do other things. Uh, so it's not just a completely random network uh, like what we do when we train a, a network um, in machine learning. And so there, there, there are probably more issues that I'm not talking about here. Uh, so these are reasons that we should move beyond um, this first generation. Um, and now how should we move beyond it, right? So just um, just to recap, the first generation here, we're talking about single cognitive task, a single uh, module rate-based RNN, and then training algorithm is uh, bad propagation based. And then hopefully uh, in the future, we can get to more naturalistic cognition. Uh, we can incorporate multiple areas and cell types and so on. And then uh, we can have biological learning and plasticity rules. So how do we go from the first generation to the future? So today I will talk about a few works. Um, some is uh, done by me, but some, some is collabor collaborative um, that really just start to explore, right? These, um, this effort, it's uh, nothing, is, nothing is fully satisfactory yet. So first let's talk about how we can move away from uh, looking at a single cognitive task. So of course, uh, prefrontal cortex uh, is engaged in many, many things, right? It's not just a single task. You can, the same neurons be involved in working memory and decision-making and other things. So how does the same circuit perform many tasks? So this was the scientific motivation for us uh, when we did this work. Um, so this is, uh, this is already published two years ago. Um, so we can come up with some hypothesis, right? How the same circuit can perform many different tasks. And so on a single neural level, um, it's possible that you have a very clustered solutions versus not clustered solutions. So what do I mean by that? Uh, let's say you look at how a network represents two different tasks. It's possible in one extreme that you have a completely um, private network for each task, right? And then they're, uh, they're completely independent. Or you can have a complete mixture, right? Where each neuron is involved in both tasks, maybe to a different extent. And so, and then there's a gradient in between them. And so there's another uh, axis, which I'm not gonna talk much about today, but uh, it's whether or not you can represent these tasks compositionally. So I'll skip this uh, today. Um, so in this work, together with uh, Mehdi Jogokar, Francis Sun, Bill Newsom, and Xiao Jing Wang, what we did is um, to try to investigate uh, potential solutions in neural networks. So what we did is uh, take a single module, recurrent neural network, kind of very similar to what uh, David Sassillo and other people use. And then uh, we simply train it on uh, many different tasks that cognitive neuroscientists have studied, uh, particularly in animals like monkeys. So this includes a memory-guided saccade, parametric working memory, perceptual decision-making, context-dependent decision-making, 
multi-sensory integration, anti-saccade, delay mesh sample, and delay mesh category. And uh, some technical details. So here we use vanilla recurrent neural networks and train it with um, simple stochastic gradient descent, uh, Adam in particular. Uh, so the equation is, is rather straightforward and very similar to how you would code up um, a traditional neural network model, a rate-based neural network model. An important detail is that all the tasks are randomly interleaved during training. So now we have this network and it can perform these tasks pretty, uh, pretty well. It, it's actually pretty fast to train. It takes maybe an hour to train on the CPU, laptop CPU. Um, and now we need to quantify how each neuron is engaged in each task. And we need to quantify it in a way that's generalized to all the tasks we have. Uh, so we, int we introduce a simple measure called task variance. Uh, so what it does is uh, you can take a unit and you can look at uh, its activity across different task conditions. So this can correspond to different stimulus or different uh, response uh, in one task, uh, different conditions in one task. So you have these different curves and then you, you simply look at the variance across these curves, right? As a single time point and then average across time point. So in the end, you get a single number for each neuron and each task. And then you can do that for all the tasks. Then you get 20 numbers for 20 tasks. And that tells you, for example, this unit really um, care about the, the task conditions in these tasks, but not so much in these tasks. And then you can do that, of course, for every, net, uh, every unit in the network. And we get a plot like this. Uh, here, the color indicates how strong a neuron is uh, engaged in a task. So each column here is, um, is one neuron and each row is one task. We already got rid of all the neurons that are completely silent. Um, and what you, can, what you can see here is that uh, when we sort this, uh, it's already obvious that there's some clusters of neurons. Um, so some neurons, they have very similar kind of engagement across tasks. For example, this set of neurons is engaged in this set of tasks. Now, importantly, uh, it's not that um, you have, for each task, you have a specific cluster, right? Uh, and in fact, um, these clusters, they, they usually are involved in multiple tasks and each task usually involve multiple clusters. So what this is suggesting is that um, perhaps it's not that each task correspond to a cluster here, but an underlying cognitive process would correspond to a functional module. And, um, and for example, it can be seen um, more carefully when we look at the specific task. So I didn't tell you the task, but these are uh, decision-making tasks and these are working memory tasks. And people have uh, suggested that working memory and decision-making can have the similar uh, underlying neural circuit. And here we have a, a module that is engaged in both decision-making and working memory task. And so we can also look at uh, whether or not uh, this is causal. So you can lesion each cluster at a time. And you can see that if you lesion a cluster, for example, cluster five, then it would hurt uh, the task where uh, the, the task variance is high. So, so telling us these clusters are causal to good performance. Uh, do these results hold across different architectures slash activation functions slash other modifications, ergo dropout? Right, um, that's a great question. So we did look at um, kind of a combination of hyperparameters. And, and in general, I think that's very important. There was a time when uh, these uh, papers published just a single set of hyperparameter and that's, that's not satisfying. Um, here, we train hundreds of networks with different combinations and most hyperparameters don't matter. Uh, we did find that the clustering result seems to depend on the activation function choice. So here we use the activation, activation function that is, um, that is rectifying at the, um, at the lower, uh, at the lower, lower values, right? So 
if a neuron receives negative input or low input, it's not very active. Um, if we don't have that, then it seems like we don't get clusters. So we don't really understand it. Um, so, you know, more work is needed to, to uh, figure this out. That's, that's a good question. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, we have a follow up to it. Uh, you'd mentioned once you exclude the inactive neurons, you get the heat map. Uh, what fraction of neurons were excluded? It's a small proportion, maybe 20%. Um, yes, I, I don't, I don't think uh, that is a major concern. You can, if you want, you can probably make sure that all the neurons are active um, by, for example, just in the network during training, you, if a neuron has been consistently silent, you just remove it from the network and then you can have a network where everyone is active and then the result would be the same, I think. Uh, so one question is about catastrophic forgetting, which is a great question because it leads me to the next slide. Uh, um, so as I mentioned earlier, so this is uh, all the tasks are interleaved. So we don't really have the catastrophic forgetting problem, but if we do train them sequentially, then yes, we would have this problem. And just for people who are not familiar with catastrophic forgetting, um, the idea is simple. If you train a network, and then uh, on one task and it finds some parameter that is good for the task. And then you train it on another task without going back to the first task. Well, then it's gonna find parameters that's good for the other task, task two, which is not necessarily good for task one anymore, right? So then you forget task one. So this is a, this is a pretty big problem that people have spent a lot of effort on in the past five years. And uh, some of the earlier work uh, on this, uh, some of the uh, earliest work on this, right, uh, use essentially this uh, idea that you can penalize deviation of important synaptic weights. So if some, if you have a method to determine that some synapses are important for a previously learned task, then you can try to not mess with it, right? You can try to protect it. Uh, and technically, you can add a penalty to the loss function to prevent uh, the weight from moving away. And so we used uh, one of these methods um, developed by Friedman Zenk and uh, in Surya Ganguly's group called uh, Synaptic Intelligence. And what you see here is on um, the task performance uh, when you're using just directly, um, when you're directly applying gradient descent versus when you're using this continual learning technique. Um, so here, what we do is we first train it on this task, then on this task, then on these tasks, and so on. And what you can see is, um, for example, if you look at this task, uh, when you're training it, of course, it's doing pretty well. But when you're not training it anymore, then uh, the performance starts to drop uh, and using traditional method but using continual learning method, you can get better. And this is quantified here. So this is a performance after all the training. So it's measured at the end uh, across all tasks. And you can see, for example, for this task, uh, it really makes a big difference. If, you, uh, if you're using this continual learning method, you can do much better than if you do traditional method. But of course, if we just stop here, then this is just another application of their very nice rule, right? Uh, what we wanna do is, again, look at the neural representation and see whether or not continual learning is having an impact on the representation. And in this case, we also wanna compare with data. Uh, so to compare with data, what we will do is we will focus on just two tasks um, because that's where we have the data. So these are the context dependent uh, decision-making one and two tasks which is the Monte task that uh, I started, uh, I introduced earlier. So now we, we need to have a measure that uh, focus on just two tasks. Uh, so if you remember this plot, this is a task variance uh, map. And then if you look at these two tasks, you can already see some structure, right? You can see these neurons are engaged in both tasks, whereas these neurons are engaged in uh, DM1 and these neurons are engaged in DM2. So we can quantify that better uh, 
using this fractional task variance, which is simply um, the task variance for one task minus the task variance for another task divided by their sum. And so what this gives you is a number between minus one and one for each neuron. And then we can plot the distribution of this value across the network. And so if this value is close to one, it means that the neuron is only involved in one of the tasks. And if it's um, close to minus one, then it's only involved in the other task. And if it's close to zero, it means it's equally involved in both tasks. So here in this network, we see that we have these three peaks corresponding to three modules. Uh, now, what is the impact of continual learning? So what I showed you here, this is without continual learning. So this is from our previous results. If we introduce continual learning, so here uh, C equals to one uh, correspond to continual learning. What you can see is that there is a very big difference, very big change in the neural representation. Now, I want to remind you that the performance is very similar, right? So all that's uh, all that's changing is the learning rule. And uh, what this suggests is that when we have continual learning, it would actually increase mixing. So you have more mixing and less modularity, at least in these two tasks. Uh, and we can compare uh, this result with uh, prefrontal cortex data recorded from monkeys doing very similar tasks. And what we see here uh, is that at least in these two tasks, in the area we're looking at, uh, it seems like the, uh, the data is more consistent with the network trained with continual learning. Um, so I hope, uh, okay. So there is another question about uh, spatial locality. Uh, is there a spatial locality in the clusters or neurons that are assigned to similar clusters nearby connected? That's a good question. So we don't have topology here. Um, but an interesting application is to embed neurons in kind of a two dimensional sheet. And then you can say, you can also introduce some cost in like long range connections, right? And then you can look at the interplay between uh, spatially embedded neurons and, um, and clustering. Right. Um, thank you. That's a good question. Uh, okay, so I'll move on for now and I'll come back to see if there are highly voted questions. Okay. So just briefly mention that when I was doing that, uh, that work, uh, it became very obvious that it's, it's very kind of tedious to code up 20 tasks, right? And then it'd be tedious if someone has to do it again. So uh, working with uh, Manuel Milano at EDBOPS in Barcelona, we have been, we have this uh, kind of collection of tasks that we have open sourced online. So feel free to check it out. Okay. Um, so I'll move on to talk about another work uh, where we try to introduce more biological learning and plasticity rule in these recurrent networks. So in particular, uh, we introduce short-term plasticities. So these are um, short-term synaptic changes that last usually hundreds of milliseconds to, to a couple of seconds. Um, and they have been hypothesized to be important for uh, many things, including working memory. So the classical theory about working memory is that it's based on persistent neural activity. Right? And, uh, and this hypothesis has been refined. So you can have, so this is a space of neural uh, neuro activity. And if you wanna store something, you can store it in some sustained state, right? You can store it in a unique dynamic trajectory, or you can even store it in some transient trajectory where it would go up and then go down. But of course, the direction that it goes up depend on what you're storing in working memory. Uh, now, an alternative hypothesis was um, was proposed, which is that, or it's not so much an alternative; it's a complementary uh, co 
uh, complementary uh, hypothesis, uh, which is that uh, working memory can rely on short-term synaptic plasticity. So the way that it works is that uh, first you activate some neurons when you show a stimulus, and that would strengthen the connections going out of these neurons. So that even when the neurons, themse neurons themselves are no longer active, you still have the trace of memory in the synapse. And then you can essentially recover that, uh, that trace by reactivating this population um, just uniformly. And then, but because these synapses are, have been strengthened, they would be able to reactivate the neurons that are relevant. Um, so, so this is a hypothesis and it's, it's uh, people have designed clever experiments to test this hypothesis in, um, in humans and animals, but it's, it's a fairly difficult thing because it's very hard to measure uh, synaptic variables, right? So what we thought is, okay, maybe we can look at this in neural networks. In particular, we want to test a hypothesis that working memory is more active. It relies more on activity when it needs to be manipulated. So the intuition is that if you store something in synaptic weights, so that's very good. It gives you high capacity, but it's very hard to change whatever you're storing because the synaptic weights, um, you know, it's, it's not as easy to modify as activity. Uh, so our game plan here to test this hypothesis is to first introduce uh, recurrent networks with short-term plasticity and then train them on various working memory tasks. And then we would quantify their reliance on activity versus plasticity-based mechanisms. And finally, we would test if working memory is more active when it needs to be manipulated. So this is a really a fun collaboration with Nick Moss and Dave Friedman at Chicago. Uh, Nick Moss is a postdoc with Dave Friedman and did you know 95% of the work. This is I did very little here. Um, so so first we introduce RNNs with short-term plasticity. Now all we need is to have um, uh, an implementation of short-term plasticity that is rate-based. So then it works with our rate-based neurons. And then we train them on uh, various working memory tasks. Now importantly, uh, we chose tasks where some tasks have a low level of manipulation and some task has a high level of manipulation. So I'll show you what I mean. So for example, in this delay measure sample task, uh, you have a fixation and then sample and then delay period and then a test stimulus. So what you need to, um, to report is whether or not the test is the same direction as a sample. Now in this case, you don't need to manipulate the sample stimulus. All you need to do is remember it. Now this is in contrast to a, um, a modified task that is delayed mesh to rotated sample where you still uh, have similar structure, but now a match is when the sample is 90 degree uh, away from, from the test, right? Um, so in this case, um, intuitively, you need to do some effective rotation of the sample stimulus, either during encoding or during the delay period so that you can compare it with a test, right? I mean, it's not necessarily how the network works, but we thought this is one way to introduce uh, a need for manipulation in the network. And we have a series of tasks like this, and then we need to quantify uh, the network's reliance on activity versus plasticity-based mechanisms. And because this is a recurrent network, we can do whatever we want with it, right? So we can try to decode um, the amount of information about the stimulus that is available in, in uh, neural activity uh, and synaptic variables. So for example, in this, in this, in a network trained on this uh, delay mesh sample task, 
so here each curve corresponds to uh, an independently trained network. Here you can see that you can decode uh, the, the stimulus very well from synapses. But you, uh, in some networks, you cannot decode them from neurons at all uh, towards the end of the delay period. And all of these networks, they can do the task just fine. So what this is telling us is uh, this recurrent network, uh, when endowed with uh, short-term plasticity, can solve delay mesh sample task uh, with a silent working memory mechanism, where uh, at the end of the delay period, the network is, um, is silent. There is no neural activity. And in comparison, in a network trained on this delayed mesh to rotate its sample task, you see all the networks, they have some decodable information in neural activity during the delay period. And we can quantify that. Um, and so we can quantify how much information is in the persistent activity. So finally, this allows us to test if uh, working memory tend to be more active when it needs to be manipulated. So we also have a measure for how much uh, manipulation is happening in, uh, in the network for each task. And this allows us to make a plot uh, like the following, where for each task, we can measure in the network um, how much it relies on persistent activity versus how much manipulation is happening. So to measure manipulation, we essentially look at um, the vector that, that is uh, the activity vector at the beginning of the delay period versus uh, kind of a synaptic vector. Here, this each synaptic, uh, here we have one synaptic variable for each neuron because uh, essentially the mechanism is presynaptic. And then now we have two vectors and we can we can uh, look at whether or not these two vectors are similar or not. So if they're very similar, then that indicates low level of manipulation. And if they're not similar, that's high level. Uh, so what we see is that uh, there is a very strong correlation between the level of manipulation in the network and the amount of persistent neural activity. Indicates that um, it's possible that uh, in the brain, more persistent activity is seen in tasks that require more manipulation. So finally, um, I will just briefly talk about one work and then, um, then talk about some discussion points. So, so another thing that is missing in the classical paradigm is that it doesn't, there is no place for evolution and development. So you start with a randomly recurrent network randomly connected network, and then you just train it on one task. But of course, we go in, we go in uh, the lab with a lot of knowledge already. Um, so how do we build that in, and why would that be useful for explaining data? Right? So here, uh, in this collaboration with Manuel Milano and Jaime de la Rocha at Edibops, uh, we looked at a suboptimal behavior that they discovered uh, in a previous paper. So here they train rats to do simple decision-making tasks, left or right. Now the interesting design is that uh, there are blocks where the correct choice tend to repeat, and then there are blocks where the correct choice tend to alternate. And then uh, animals do something, the rats, they do something strange, right? So in the repeat block, they tend to repeat more. So that's, that's correct. That's the right thing to do, but uh, if there's a single arrow, if they experience a single arrow, they essentially just throw away that information about whether or not they're in the repeating block or alternating block. And so they treat the two blocks the same. So this is uh, quite confusing um, and it's not the optimal thing to do. And so uh, you can quantify this behavior with a reset index and if it's high, uh, it's more, uh, it means it kind of uh, ignores uh, the block it's in and just treats them the same. And so these are results from different rats. And then if you train a network directly on this task, then you don't see this behavior. Uh, so which to some extent is ex expected because this behavior is suboptimal. And if you train a network uh, 
very heavily on one task, then you don't, there's no guarantee that it will learn an optimal strategy, but it, it certainly, uh, it tries to do that. So, so we thought, okay, how do we address this discrepancy? Um, and we thought, okay, in a natural environment, but not in a two AFC case, not in a two alternative force choice case, in a natural environment, a correct and an error uh, is not equally informative, right? A correct is good because you can just keep doing what you have been doing. Whereas if you get an error, it just says that what you're doing is wrong, but it doesn't tell you what is the right thing that you should be doing. So, um, so we thought, okay, maybe we can um, use this intuition uh, to build this intuition into our network. So what we did is uh, we pre-train uh, network on an NAFC task. So instead of a two AFC, where the network always see two choices, where uh, if you get arrow on one, that means the other choice is correct. We train on a two NAFC. And when we pre-train it on NAFC and then test it on this two AFC task, then the network does reset. And in fact, there is a parametric relationship between how complex the environment you use for pre-training and whether or not the network uh, behaves more like animal. And so here, as you can see, as you increase the number of, of choices in the pre-training environment, uh, the network approach uh, have higher and higher reset index. So this is an example where taking into account of the history, right? It can be evolutionary or it can be developmental um, of, uh, of animals before they enter the lab can uh, presumably help us better capture suboptimal behaviors of animals, right? And the suboptimal behaviors in themselves may not be suboptimal uh, in general. They may just be suboptimal in that specific task. So finally, I want to end with some um, kind of discussion points. So I have shown you three examples about how to, um, how to um, go beyond the first generation. So one thing I really want to do uh, in my new lab at MIT is to look at multi-area models. Now, I want to make a case that uh, we can already build multi-area models if we're only focused on engineering. Right, so it's so for those those of you who use PyTorch, you know, to be, to go from one area to n areas, you just it's a single number, right? When you do torch dot rnn, um, and and then this work that I did together with Igor Garnichev, John Schlenz, and David Cicillo uh, back at Google, so what we did is build a, a multi-area model that incorporate. Visual, uh, visual areas, a short-term memory uh, area, a semantic uh, memory area, and a controller that sends a lot of feedback. Uh, so feedback to these earlier areas um, about different attention mechanisms. And so, so we built this mechanism. Uh, we built this network really uh, in admiration of uh, the classical cognitive control model that propose that prefrontal cortex kind of guide how information is transformed from sensory through association to output areas, right? So here, similarly, our controller guide how information is processed in earlier areas. So we can build a, a complex model like this and it can do complicated things, right? So it can do, uh, it can perform uh, pretty well on this um, clever data set that was proposed uh, several years ago, um, where a network is shown image like this and then is asked questions, are there an equal number of large things and metal spheres? So this is already a pretty complex task and I would argue is, is uh, more complicated in many ways than most tasks that we study in, uh, in animals. So, so this is showing that from an engineering standpoint, uh, maybe we already have the computer power and the tools to build sophisticated network that can have multiple areas and do very sophisticated things, at least in terms of animal cognition. 
Um, but we're not done because there are many scientific questions that are not answered, right? If we care about science. So for example, one thing is how do we capture the diversity across brain areas with a few principles? So I'll go into more about this in the next slide. And there are uh, many more, for example, how to meaningfully map RNN areas to brain areas. Uh, how to evaluate multiple area, uh, multi-area models across many experimental data sets. How should multi-area models be trained? Right? So here we just train it on one massive task or you can meta train it on some massive metadata sets. But is that the answer? Right? Maybe it is, maybe it's not, we don't know. And there are many more. And so to give you a taste of the challenge um, ahead of us, uh, so I'll talk about this, this question of how to capture the diversity of, across areas with a few principles. Um, so, so earlier I was talking about prefrontal cortex as if it's just a single area. And of course it's not, right? It consists of many areas. So this is just a, a view of the, the lateral, uh, lateral areas in prefrontal cortex and there are many more areas. Um, and, and they each have kind of not completely different, but different properties and different engagement across, across task. So how can we build models that meaningfully capture this diversity? So one idea, or perhaps the only idea I would say that we have right now is to rely on area specific long range connectivity. Right. So one example is to build in kind of hierarchical organization where you have uh, several areas and you can have the first area receive or preferentially receive sensory inputs and then the last area preferentially uh, produce motor outputs and then middle areas that is in the middle. Right. So that's one way that we can build area specific long range connectivity and it does uh, work. Um, to some extent, it can, the early area, for example, in this very nice paper uh, by Jonathan Michaels and colleagues, this early area is more uh, similar to parietal, uh, parietal cortex that they recorded, and middle area is more similar to prefrontal cortex, and then the last area is more similar to motor cortex. And so another possibility is, um, is to have, for example, different readout. So here uh, in this uh, in this work back in 2017, we built a, a two area network where um, it's trained, um, it's an actor critic structure trained, um, trained on a bunch of tasks. Uh, and this area um, need to produce action outputs. And whereas this area need to produce a value of the state right, in reinforcement learning. And what we see is that uh, this action producing area is more similar to DLPFC, whereas this value producing area is more similar to orbital frontal cortex. Right? Um, but these are just uh, some examples. What we lack is kind of a more, um, just a, a more general demonstration that this principle work. And we also need to understand to what extent this, this doesn't work, this is not enough. Uh, so finally, I'll end by saying, um, how should we build uh, next generation RNN models uh, with a certain style, right? Uh, I've been struggling a lot or thinking a lot about this uh, because, um, you know, many of us, we read a lot of machine learning papers and at some point you start to think more like machine learning people, right? You're tempted by that. And, uh, but on as the other hand, you all, if we want to do science, we cannot completely do machine learning, right? So how do we strike the balance? Uh, so this is just my thoughts and it's, you know, just some ideas. Uh, one is that uh, we should have a continual commitment to functions. And so today, mainly I talk about how we should introduce biology in the network. But of course, if you, just focus on that, then the networks may not be able to do interesting things. And then we kind of lose the whole point of, of studying these recurrent networks in the first place. Right? Um, so we should still commit to studying um, interest uh, networks that can do interesting things. 
but at the same time, we should stay close uh, to experimental data, right? If we just focus on building very, very powerful machines, then um, we become kind of, far, it's farther, we become farther away from science and it's harder to see the relevance to the brain. And then finally, I think we should emphasize both quantitative metrics and intellectual insights. Uh, so I think in our field, um, it has been predominantly on intellectual insights and that's great, but um, we can also learn something from, from vision and also from machine learning where a large scale benchmark is, um, is used but we shouldn't rely solely on that. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank um, people that over the years have been working on this line of work. I only got to talk, talk about some of these work. Uh, in particular, I want to thank Francis Son, um, who, who went to DeepMind, uh, and then Xiao Jing, who was my PhD advisor at NYU, and then Mal Manuel Malano, uh, with whom uh, I did several work. It was really fun collaboration. Uh, Nick Moss, who's brilliant uh, at U Chicago, and David Sosillo, who hosted me at, at Google. And of course, thank you. <laughs>